Now, Mayor Hartsfield, William B. Hartsfield, was the mayor of Atlanta at the time. And when the train was getting ready to cross the Mason-Dixon line, one of the amazing things was that people began to question, how are you going to have a freedom train fighting, saying you believe in democracy, and then you're going to have segregated lines on the train? How are you going to pull that off? Langston Hughes actually wrote a poem about it called The Freedom Train, questioning what kind of train, what kind of freedom is that? And so eventually the Heritage Foundation decided that once the train crossed the Mason-Dixon line, there would be no segregated lines. Now, a few states still skipped by and got some segregated lines. Savannah, Georgia, for instance, had segregated lines. There were a couple of cities in Virginia that actually got by with segregated lines. But by the time it was supposed to come to Georgia, William Hartsfield took a stand against all the other Southern mayors and said, look, if you come to Atlanta, we're going to integrate. We'll integrate the lines. And so there were other mayors who followed suit once he made his argument. Now, one of the things that happened, though, was Birmingham decided they were not going to integrate their lines. And up until the last minute, they hadn't made a definitive uh, hadn't voiced their de definitive disposition as to whether they would have uh, allowed them to integrate the lines. But by the time the train came to Atlanta, the decision had been made. Birmingham said, no, absolutely not. We want to have segregated lines. The Heritage Foundation said, well, the train cannot come there. So the train actually stayed in Atlanta two days instead of one day because of that. So it was in Atlanta for two days. So people who, hadn't, who had planned to just see it that one day, and it was really cold. It was like winter weather. It was January. Uh, so people fought the snow and sleet to come to see the train in Atlanta. Uh, this is uh, Cabbage Town, where I decided to set the story. And I did it in Cabbage Town because during that time, um, Cabbage Town was a small community built around a mill where the people were working for very low wages. And if they decided they didn't want to work, they had tried to have a strike in 1914. And what the company did, the cotton mill, just evicted the people. If you didn't want to work, they just threw your furniture outside and locked the doors. So by 1947 and 48, the people didn't protest the low wages they got because they didn't want to be evicted. They had all moved here from either the Appalachian Mountains or other rural areas and felt like they couldn't go back home. Now, there are three different stories three or four different stories of why it was called Cabbage Town. But what you have to remember is in 1948, the people who lived in Cabbage Town didn't call it Cabbage Town. Only the people who didn't like the people who lived in Cabbage Town called it Cabbage Town. The people who lived in Cabbage Town called it the old mill town. They called it their mill town. The reason why there were several stories floating around, one is that a truck turned over and cabbage fell in the yard, and all the people came out and got the cabbage and started cooking it in their house. That's one story. Another story is that it was a car that turned over, and the cabbages fell into their yard. And the third story is that because the people came from Appalachia and they loved cabbage, that they planted cabbage in their front yards and started cooking it every day. Now, the people that I've talked to who lived in Cabbage Town in 1948 said none of that is true, and they don't know why they called it Cabbage Town. But it wasn't them that named it, so they have no idea why they would do something like that. Now, one of the things I loved about doing the research um, about the train is that, well, for one, I've always loved trains. You know, I love the history of trains in this country. I love to ride on the train. And I think it's fascinating that so many people in, in, in our time didn't even know anything about the Freedom Train. Uh, of course, the Freedom Train couldn't do what it did then, now, because the documents, uh, archivists know that traveling, moving documents around is not really healthy for the documents, not a good thing for them. And also, the, the whole idea of somebody trying to steal the documents would be paramount now. 
So you wouldn't have the kind of relaxed situation that they had on many instances in, during the train's travels. And so now I'll let you ask me any question you want. Okay, maybe I should read. I think I'll read a little excerpt from the Freedom Train. <clears throat> As I said, Clyde Thomason is the um, protagonist in this book. I'll read a little description. He's 12 years old. He's proud to have a brother who guards the Freedom Train. His brother's a Marine on the train. It travels to um, 48 states, 322 stops, carrying the documents. And uh, he's going to meet an African-American boy named William Dobbs who's going to become his friend while we're in the book. But the book starts out while he's in school. And his name, uh, as I said, is Clyde Thomason. But his nemesis name is Philip Granger. Captain Chester Saves the Day is the, top, is the chapter title. Philip Granger was the most ornery, hateful body that ever stepped foot in our school, and he never stopped proving it. He was in my class because they kicked him out of his fancy private school. Seemed like we was getting the punishment, though, since seeing how he tortured us all. A couple of days before Christmas vacation weren't no different. I was minding my own business when I heard psst from two rows back. Miss Fowler clapped her hands and said, Get out your history books and read silently, class. Psst, psst, psst. I didn't look back. I opened my book. The ps was getting louder. I twisted in my seat and saw Philip Granger smirking at me. Hey, Clyde, Philip whispered. Philip always said my name like it was bad as eating a pile of dookie. His pa was a boss at the cotton mill. Philip didn't waste any time throwing it up at our faces that his pa told his ma, but his pa told our ma's and pa's what to do. Ain't nothing we could say about it neither since it was true. We just had to grin and bear it. Philip smiled and held up a torn Marvel comic cover. Looky, looky. You better give it back to him, Philip, Ronnie said. He sat in the real middle row between us. He was my best friend since we was little. Philip half standing reached across two people and gave him a pluck in the head. You better stay out of this. That's what you better do, Ronnie Shoemate. It's okay, Ronnie, I said. My brother's going to send me another just like that one. I didn't know that was for sure, because I hadn't had a chance to tell Joseph that Philip Granger had snatched my comic and tore it. It was his latest attack in a long list of meanness, and I didn't want Joseph to think I couldn't stand up for myself. Now I was about to explode, but I didn't want no more trouble. Just yesterday, me and Philip went at it in the field after he snatched the comic book out of my hand. It was the cover with Captain Marvel and the Freedom Train. I only had it because my brother Joseph was one of the Marines guarding the train. But like always, Miss Fowler only saw me doing the scuffling, and she gave me the whooping instead of Philip. Psst, psst. I guess I needed to make my life more miserable. It wasn't enough that I was the shortest 12-year-old in seventh grade, or maybe it wasn't enough that my blonde hair had a permanent cowlick that people teased me about, because I did what I shouldn't have done. Look back again, just asking for it. Philip held up the caught Captain Marvel cover. He balled it up slowly in his left hand. Then he hawked the glob on it. I hunkered down as Philip's bony fingers squeezed the paper tighter, the muscles in his arm flexing. I knew what was coming next. I squinted my eyes at him like Mama does when she's warning me about something. Miss Fowler was rummaging around at her desk. <clears throat> I cleared my throat so she'd look up. Philip threw the spitball. Miss Fowler didn't see nothing. Seemed like she weren't never looking when Philip did something bad. I ducked, but not soon enough. Splat! It hit me and popped off to the floor beside my chair. I could feel the slime of Philip Granger's spit on the side of my ear. I grabbed for the handkerchief in my shirt pocket, and that's when I knew I was doomed. Cause Chester, that was my frog, started squirming. I packed him in my pocket that morning with some moss, wet dirt, and grass underneath my handkerchief. He'd been so still and quiet, I forgot about him. Now I poked his head back down. I said as quiet as I could, stay still. Chester hated being poked. I felt him pushing to get out. 
I grabbed him. That got him riled, and he told me so in his itty-bitty dog-barking tree frog voice. Miss Fowler's head jerked up. Who is making that noise? One of my favorite things about frogs and crickets is there ain't hardly no way to tell where the sound they're making is coming from. I tried to sit still, squeezing Chester's side to keep him from hopping out, but he just yelled louder. Miss Fowler stood up calmly, like nothing was going on. Just watching her, you wouldn't guess she was about to snatch up her ruler. It was 12 inches long, and mostly every kid knew how to measure on account of it. Six inches done hit me just yesterday, and my hand was still smarting from it. Miss Fowler gave the evil eye to each one of us like she could see right through to our brains and read our minds. Slapping the ruler on her palm, Miss Fowler walked between the desks. Then she held up her hand so we could see how red it was, just to show her she meant business. Each of us looked down hard at our book, aiming to look innocent. Then Chester started squirming, trying to escape. I squeezed him harder just for a second. He barked, quit it, real loud. I had to think fast or I was a goner. I did a fake hiccup and hoped Miss Fowler would think that was the noise she heard. Miss Fowler said, all right, I've had quite enough. Who is making that noise? I know a real hiccup from a fake one, and that most certainly was a fake one. I wondered, how could anyone know the difference between a fake hiccup and a real one? Someone said, where could I learn how to do fake hiccups, Miss Fowler? Then the entire class started hiccuping and laughing. Miss Fowler was boiling mad now. She smacked her hand again as she walked past me to the back of the opposite row and slammed her ruler down on the desk. I don't know what come over me, cause most times I ain't no tattletale. Maybe it was cause I hadn't seen her so mad before. Or maybe I suppose cause she was already walking back my way. But all of a sudden I blurted out, Philip Granger threw a spitball at me. Miss Fowler appealed to get taller. Philip Granger? What has possessed you, she said, and cracked him across his knuckles. Ow, Philip yelled. I had to give it to Miss Fowler. When she got mad, she whacked anybody. It wasn't me, Philip shouted. Are you telling me, are you yelling at me, Philip Granger? Miss Fowler said, her eyes stretched open, her finger pointed at Philip, her face as red as her hair. No one shouts at me in my classroom, young man. Chester pushed to get out. I squeezed again, he barked again. I couldn't keep squeezing him or I'd kill him. I just dropped my head. Unless Miss Fowler believed Philip was the best ventriloquist in all of Fulton County, it was all over for me. Now Miss Fuller was, Fowler was really fired up. She spun around and peered over the rims of her black cat eye glasses as she came toward me. See, right there, Philip said, pointing at me by his desk. He just dropped that spitball he was gonna throw at me. Miss Fowler leaned over and examined the balled up paper with the end of her ruler. Isn't it that Marvel comic book with the freedom train on it, Clyde Thomason? Uh, I, I didn't, didn't do it, Philip Gr Gr Granger threw that at, at, at me. Clyde, you're the only student with one of those freedom train comic books. Are you letting someone else take the blame for your shenanigans? That's perfectly all right. Miss Fowler said, walking to her desk. She laid down the 12-inch ruler and picked up Mr. Justice. But, 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 I, 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 not another word, Miss Fowler said. I don't want to hear it. Your brother is the pride of Cabbage Town, and you've destroyed the gift he sent you just to make a spitball? An ingrate, that's what you are, Clyde Thompson. Weren't no call to say nothing now, stuttering or not. In Miss Fowler's hand was a big old wood paddle in the shape of a flattened out baseball bat that had Mr. Justice printed on it like a first grader done wrote it with a nail. Kids said Miss Fowler scratched the name on it with her fangs. Miss Fowler pulled her chair in front of her desk and sat down facing the class. She patted her knees. Come forward, Clyde Thompson. Mr. Justice is waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Now, when I write a book like this, um, I do extensive research. And this was a lot of fun because the people I found, seven people that lived in Cabbage Town that would have been 12 years old in 1948, and questioned them extensively till they didn't want to see me anymore ever again. 
Uh, and one of those people was the famous uh, folk singer from Cabbage Town named Joyce Brookshire, who was just invaluable to me in every way. Uh, and one of the things that happened was Joyce Brookshire's mother had kept a diary about their life in Cabbage Town. And she'd also, with three other women, written a cookbook that had some little family stories in it. And then Joyce Brookshire and some of her friends had also done a play. So I would take that play and type in all the, the whole book two or three times until I learned the language and the cadence that they spoke it. So the dialect that you hear is not something I made up, but the way the people in Cabbage Town actually spoke during that time. The other thing I would do is I would find out all the music that was popular during the time. All of, I also know what kind of weather it is during the time that I'm writing. I know what the fauna is, the flora is in the area. I know <clears throat> what people are eating in their homes during that time, what people are selling in stores, in grocery stores, what movies are playing, uh, what's the popular music, what, what books are being printed, who's reading what. So I'm doing extensive research when I'm doing that. I'm also knowing everything about the mill, the cotton mill, uh, their procedures, how they went about doing things, the people that work there, what was their background. I also know where all the people in Cabbage Town are working, what they do, what time the mill opens, closes, when it closes on a special occasion. So all of that goes into my writing historical fiction uh, because I want the work to be as authentic as possible when I'm writing and I don't want to make any mistakes. So I don't want somebody from Cabbage Town picking a story up and reading it and say, oh no, we didn't do that, we didn't have that. Um, and some of the things that people in Cabbage Town told me I never heard of. Like in this story, there is a writing spider. <laughs> I never heard of a writing spider. Uh, and of course, you, there's certain superstitions that go along with the writing spider. Like if you want to hold a writing spider and you, you have to not let the writer, writing spider look at you or something bad will happen. <laughs> so uh, it's really interesting um, little things that they had. And I, I always tell children there are lots of superstitions that I pay attention to. Because when I was a child, I had a lot of superstitions. We used to believe in North Carolina that if you kiss, if your skirt just accidentally had a fold at the end of it and it turned up and you kissed it, you'd get another dress. <laughs> I can only tell you, I kissed a lot of tails in my dress. <laughs> now, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but there was no time limit on when you would get the dress. So, you know, by the, Eventually, I would get another dress. So I would just keep kissing the tail of my dresses. So that was one of the superstitions we had. But the people in Cabbage Town had some superstitions I didn't know. And, and they, they also carried rabbit feet around with them, which is something we did when, we, you know, when I was young. I wanted to be Daniel Boone. <laughs> you know, my brother would always point out, well, you can't be Daniel Boone because you're a girl. You know, and my dad said, she can be Daniel Boone, she can be Daniela Boone, <laughs> you know. So it was a fascinating experience. I love research. I love writing about historical uh, uh, events because I get to know a lot about people that I didn't know before. Um, I also knew a lot about, uh, during that time, there was a, a great strife between black people and white people, and it was encouraged by the mill people. So the mill people actually hired, uh, well, not really hired, but I guess they didn't pay them but a, a penny, hired black people to come and evict the white people out of their houses. So that way they would always keep the poor people uh, against each other. So they, they had an ongoing thing. They would bring immigrants there, and then they would tell the white people that worked for the mill that if they didn't do right, they would bring in the immigrants. So there was a constant conflict between uh, the people in the mill who had the power and the people who worked for them. You know? And they would definitely take it out on them if they tried to uh, demand more money. 
And you have to remember, it is not too long in 1947 and 48 and 49. It has not been too long in our history that we have not, that they didn't have young children working in that mill all day long, uh, 10 hours a day sometimes, paying them up to like 48 cents, sometimes 50 cents uh, for those 13 hours or 10 hours that they were working. So that hadn't been too long uh, stopped. So it was amazing, you know, but they tried to keep any unions out, any, any collective bargaining. Uh, that was something they did not want on their property. Uh, and they would fire anybody who even mentioned the word collective bargaining. So that was just a no-no.